What's up, everyone? Greg and Ryan here for another breakdown of Castle Rock. This is episode seven, The Queen. Now, if you haven't seen episode seven yet, there are spoilers ahead, so go watch that first and get back here. Oh, yeah. But first, make sure to hit that subscribe button where we got you covered for comic deep dives, TV breakdowns, and movie reviews. Okay, let's jump into our initial thoughts now, and this episode crushed me. It is perfectly executed and absolutely heartbreaking. Uh, well done. I knew from the opening scene with the gun in the closet that this episode was gonna end in sadness, but even then I was hooked from beginning to end. Such an incredibly tragic performance by Sissy Spacek. Uh, this is the best episode of the year so far, and I think they're getting better each and every week. I totally agree. I mean, for me, this episode had just the best filmmaking craft of the series so far. Yes. And to me, the ending, like the very ending, was kind of a surprise and really effective. And honestly, this is the standout episode, at least so far this season, and it might just be the standout episode of the season. I think this is the one that people are going to be talking about. Yep. This is the point in most TV series where you get this episode, usually like seven to nine. You know, this year we had uh, in Westworld, there was Kiksuya, which was like kind of that standout episode. Yeah. And of course, you know, to us last year, the big one was uh, Got a Light, which was episode eight from Twin Peaks. The Okay, so this episode is centered on Ruth being haunted by her own repressed memories uh, due to the Alzheimer's, the town of Castle Rock, and the creepy kid. A neurologist said, find a coping mechanism. And I have one for every room in the house. See, I can get lost in the past. These are my breadcrumbs. If I find a chess piece in the icebox, well, I know it's now, not then. And I can find my way out of the woods. On to some bookkeeping for this week. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of things were revealed in this episode related to the plot, and most of the way that was done, right, was by actually going back to older scenes and lending new context. And what I really liked about this week's, my favorite one was where Ruth is in the kitchen and she's throwing away her medication after she talked to Wendell. Yeah. And you know, the previous version of that scene just had her spilling pills on the ground and you sort of are at that moment like, yep, yeah, she doesn't have her shit together. Like that sort of reaction. And then the kid walks in and you're like, oh my God. But now it's this like purposefully like trying to stay sharp, trying to keep her mind clean. And then she just spills them on the ground and she's trying to throw them away. And then of course that scene now is transformed with Matthew Deaver coming in instead of the kid. Okay, let's talk about Matthew Deaver now and it's confirmed he's an asshole. Yeah. Okay, so Matthew, he hears the voice of God um, when he tries to commit suicide in the woods for whatever reason it could have been because of his wife's infidelity with Alan, if that did happen, or at least that's what he thought we, was going on there. We learned that he knew. Yes. And that it definitely feels like in that picnic scene, that horrifying picnic scene, okay. that, you know, he is, he is responding to that, among other things. We also know that, you know, he has a growing frustration with Henry and I just want to say, too, that, you know, a few episodes back, I was saying how this series felt like it was missing a very classic style of Stephen King villain. And I think this episode, we get plenty of Matthew Deaver, and he definitely fits that role to me. Where he's just a despicable jerk who hates everything. Yeah, I mean, he hits all the check boxes. Yeah. He's a jerk, he's controlling and abusive, he's terrible to his family, he's absolutely insane. Lightweight racist. Right, <laughs> you know, it, 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 it is everything. And I'm, you know, it's sort of, kind of excited to have that in the show. <laughs> You're like, yes! <laughs> A monster! <laughs> A monster is here. Saul heard it on the road to Damascus, knocked him flat on his back when he got up again, wasn't Saul. He was Paul. One last note on Matthew, he brings up the schisma again. Now we can call it the schisma because of last week's episode. And how many people are affected by this? Is it the town of Castle Rock itself? Right, like it seems like this is a sort of nodal point mm -hmm. for this uh, sort of event or sound or whatever 
we're calling it, mm -hmm. or schisma, obviously, but it also seems like, you know, that's just like a, almost like an intense radiation that's probably hitting everybody. Yeah. And, you know, most of the main characters, I mean, I think, except Jackie, have all been very clearly <laughs> afflicted. Okay, let's talk about the kid slash not Pennywise. Uh, he's even creepier than ever in this episode. And Ruth thinks that it's Matthew Deaver. She thinks Matthew Deaver has come back to life now. She confirms this with Molly, who shows up in a quick little cameo. You did right. But it didn't take. He's back. In the present, not the past. But I'm gonna fix it. Also, side note, that photo they used for the bolo on that kid um, during that news broadcast with the fire in the background is priceless. It's so creepy. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Now, I can't tell if the kid's evil or just strange now. I can't tell. They, they're still on that line with him. Like, you can say, hey, he was just trying to, like, get her to go to sleep. Maybe he saw the future and he slowly... <laughs> tried to stop the events from happening, but didn't really care too much. Uh, okay, maybe maybe he is evil. There. <laughs> I'll just say it. I mean, he this definitely... This was revenge. He definitely was engineering a pretty bad circumstance for Alan. Yes, this was totally revenge on Alan. I think we can confirm that. And, you know, we know that Matthew is evil to whatever extent that... Ruth is projecting Matthew onto the kid, mm. there still is, I think, undoubtedly malevolence with the kid. Yeah. And I'm sure there will still be some debate as to like whether it was really Matthew possessing him to be evil. You know, are we gonna, is there gonna be a, you know, a wand waved at the end of the series where the kid wakes up and he's like, I, I, I don't remember anything, any, I couldn't, yeah. you know, but. I don't it, know. It doesn't, doesn't, doesn't feel that way right now. No. So we'll have to wait and see. Because in total fairness to the like kid isn't all bad perspective, you mm -hmm. know, his, he's consciously adopting Matthew's, you know, not necessarily entirely his identity, but his, some of his behaviors. And in part, like some of that is protective. Mm -hmm. You know, he asks her to lay down where he can see her and it does feel very sinister in that moment, but it also is like she's a little out of it and it could be a little bit protective. Mm -hmm. He puts on the music that Matthew uh, requested at their wedding and he says that and uh, you know, he's definitely from the malevolent perspective trying to make her comfortable and maybe preparing to do something terrible. But on the other hand, you could make a case that there was something just caretaker-like about it. I mean, at the same I think, time, I think the, it's tough. I think the he's, he might be good thing is slipping very quickly <laughs> down the slope, but there's still a little wiggle room left, is what I'm trying to say. Okay. Okay, let's talk about Molly for a second because she has a brief cameo here. It's quick, brief. Quick stop in. Quick, uh, but there's a huge development in there. With the fact is that Ruth knows that Molly killed Matthew. Right. <laughs> and is okay with that. It's, I feel like at this point, like the whole town's like, oh honey, we, we, know, we knew you did it the whole time. We just <laughs> didn't, we thought Matthew was an asshole. We hated him. Nobody so. liked Matthew, you did the right thing. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> She's like trying to unburden herself of this guilt for like 30 years and, everyone, and everyone's like, no, no, it's fine. Yeah, does the bartender at the Mellow Tiger know? Uh, <laughs> Jackie knew the whole time. Everybody knows about this thing. She is definitely not getting like the talking to or <laughs> like kind of anger or reproach that she has been looking for all her life from anybody. She just wants that hug and, and just, it's gonna be okay. And everyone's like, well, pff, sorry, we got enough issues in this stupid town. <laughs> Something else on the sort of good and evil back and forth we've been having over the last few episodes mm -hmm. is that, you know, we didn't really know enough about Ruth until now. You know, we were sort of thinking with, you know, her Alzheimer's or her condition or the time travel stuff that she isn't always all there and maybe mm -hmm. she was also blocking, you know, some of her repressed memories and yeah. with the possibility that she was bad. And I remember even when I first read the title of this episode and it was called The Queen, I thought, oh God, mm -hmm. she's gonna be like, she's gonna be the bad one. She's gonna be like the matriarch of the cult or yes. something like that. But instead, this 
this episode, I think, definitively just concludes that if there are any good characters in the series, it is her. Yes. Everybody else is still suspect. Poor Ruth. But she's good. Just tell him what he wants to hear. Mrs. Deaver, sorry for the wait. Finally, the last star we want to talk about in this episode it happens to be the craft itself. Uh, the film work here is just exceptional. Uh, it's so on point. Mm -hmm. The episode flows perfectly. It has a lot of ambitious transitions from one moment or time to another. Mm -hmm. You know, my favorite one is when she's coming back from Pangborn's office in the past. Yes. And re-enters her kitchen. Yeah. And it's just so smooth. I just got the feeling of um, Joe Wright's Anna Karenina. Now, uh, critics hated this, <laughs> by the way. They hated this uh, camera work. They didn't like the theater aspect he brought to it. I loved it. I love it when you don't do a hard transition and you just take the action with you to something else. The score, the editing, all wonderful. This is an episode that needs to be watched more than once to really appreciate the cinematic work at hand here. That shot right after Ruth leaves Molly to go figure out what the hell's going on in the house and it cuts to the broken picture frame of the family uh, with that record scratch right on top of it. Uh, great work. What's And talk about sticking the landing. Mm -hmm. You know, when the episode started, you know, you talked about this already, the Chekhov's gun thing. Oh, yeah. You know, you knew that gun's at going a off. certain point, I, I thought, you know, for, you know, almost, I, I could see the time ticking down mm -hmm. on the episode. And I thought, all of this great craft and the emotional build is going to be for naught when she just guns down Alan at the end of this episode, and we're gonna be like, oh, that's too bad. Mm -hmm. And But I saw it coming kind of a moment. But that's not how they book but ended. But that's it. not how they end it. Yeah. And they go back to when he came back from missing her after so many years, and it's a moment that we had heard about, a moment that we had been told about, and that they end on experiencing that moment with the context of everything that has happened so far in the season and all of her journeys through the past mm -hmm. was perfect. Yeah, even the little, okay, even had the two chess pieces, the queen standing and the king fall. Oh, great work. Now let's look at some of the things we noticed, some little details while watching this episode. Now, while there was no St. Bernard, the subtle, not so subtle Cujo and Pet Cemetery references were awesome. I couldn't have been the only person who thought that Shepard was gonna come to life right when Ruth was sticking her hand in to get those bullets I, I, in that suitcase. I'm, I'm telling you, I, I, I got creeped out for a second there. I thought, oh no, it's gonna pop its head out. It's gonna start screaming or something any second. That was the moment where the lesser show would have had the jump scare. And yep. maybe, you know, maybe- Yes, that's this is a good argument to be made here about that scene itself. Any other show they would have had that had her put her hand in there and then that dog and, starts going crazy i'm glad instead, they, they didn't do it instead they bring the dog into the scene mm -hmm. just not going after the jump scare although it's still freaky <laughs> Also, there was a small godfather nod with the dead animal in the bed, of it's course. A, it's basically impossible to you not can't. think of the godfather when somebody finds blood in bed. Nope. And early in the episode, Ruth reads Henry, Hansel, and Gretel, which actually comes up a few times in Stephen King's work, including a retelling in the preface of the uncut version of The Stand. King wanted to make a point about why he decided to re-release the book with 400 pages that were originally cut out. You can pause this video right here if you want to read it. Also, a little spoiler alert for It, there's a character in there that has a little phobia for Hansel and Gretel, and it comes to life in a way. I hope they put this in the movie, uh, part two. I really hope they do. I'm not sure if they will, because in the TV show, made for movie, it's not like that at all. So, we'll see. And then I got some heavy carry vibes. I'm sure I'm not the only one who did. Uh, I wonder if reviews are gonna have that in there too. Like carry, carry, carry scene. Um, but the scene where Ruth is um, at the her funeral for Matthew Deaver and she's walking through the hallway and she's surrounded by everyone. And then you have just the, the noise and the laughter. Just I, all I could think of is they're all gonna laugh at you over and over again. <laughs> Oh, 
sorry, Cassie. And even if it's not necessarily a carry vibe, it's still, to me, carried a sort of resemblance to um, even just more uh, like 70s and 80s horror style, uh, if that makes sense. Which is why I loved it, yes. Like it could have been like a Roman Polanski mm -hmm. scene or something like that. Also, I like this little bit of irony they had with the scene of a uh, young Alan holding up the photo of the missing dog, but it also has Henry in that photo. I thought that was cool. I know I'm not supposed to bring up Twin Peaks at all, but uh, Ruth and Matthew, they reminded me a lot of Sarah and Leland Palmer. Now, Ruth is not as complicit as Sarah was at all. Right, but the result is still a little bit the same, right? Like, yes. even her version of Matthew Deaver says, but you never left. Mm -hmm. You know, the, so she Leland. still didn't get out. It just felt so Leland, the way he's over her shoulder. You never left, you have to, or that possessed Bob kind of feel. Right. There are also a few just sort of stylistic nods, mm -hmm. if they're there. Um, oh yeah! You know the the ceiling fan in the living room <laughs> mm -hmm. is is it's very sort of Palmer home. Yeah, and the scene with the kid dancing uh, with Ruth to uh, Blue Moon, creepy. And all I could think of was my favorite scene from the original run of Twin Peaks, my favorite scene of all time, which is Leland holding the photo of Laura Palmer. <laughs> Okay, now on to just some of our final thoughts going into episode eight. Mm -hmm. What sort of questions, what's on your mind? Well, the first thing is, can we expect to see more of this ghost Matthew Deaver haunt Henry and Ruth in future episodes? That's actually a good question because, you know, it felt to me when we first saw him with Molly earlier mm -hmm. in the season that if he wasn't going to be recurring, he would definitely be a big part of the finale. But I feel like also he filled his purpose really well in this episode and mm -hmm. we could go totally without him for the rest of the season. I can see that, but I feel like they're still leading up to one more thing with Henry with him. Right. Henry right. needs to have his confrontation. His, yes. He, he needs to have his uh, eye to eye with Matthew if he can. I feel like there may be some scene where he's talking to Matthew, maybe just through the kid. Next up, where will Wendell play in the final act of this story? Um, I'm right. curious because bringing your child into the town of Castle Rock is already a dumbass idea. And on top of that, leaving uh, the child alone uh, in that house. I get it that no one thought this the kid was going to come back. Uh, I, the, the trail of events here are interesting. I do like the, the way they got that kid out of the house, though, with a quick line of dialogue where she's like, here's some cash. <laughs> Go to the mall. Get out of here. Go. And he's just like, you sure? Okay. That's it. I know before we were definitely thinking that there's a chance when we were on the how evil is Henry mm -hmm. jag of like maybe bringing Wendell in for some kind of sacrifice, something like that. Um, but, you know, so far, and we haven't talked about him a lot because there hasn't been a lot to his effect, except no. in this episode, finally, you know, he has a long uh, couple of scenes with Ruth, and he does inspire her to get sharp again. Yeah. There's the augmented reality game that he's playing, and, you know, I think augmented reality unto itself as an idea definitely sort of feeds into how people's imaginations and hallucinations are, they project onto the world, how mm -hmm. Ruth is seeing Matthew when he's not there, you know, the kid is seeing these aliens when they're not there. I could see something of, more of that theme coming through Wendell later on, but mm -hmm. I'm hoping that isn't something like The Last Starfighter where he's like really good at this video game and that translates into some real world talent to kill the enemy. Uh, oh, you mean like monster. you mean like Anakin getting into you know the Starfighter? How about uh, the girl in Jurassic Park, um, Lost World, where she kicks the Raptor? Yeah, it's things like that. Okay, the Last Starfighter was better than all of those examples. <laughs> okay, this is Diva. It's important. I think that something terrible is going to happen. Oh. It's happening. Now, one of my questions for this episode has to do with the scene with Molly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she's, she's running up to the house because she's worried about Henry. She's definitely, you know, feeling the, the filter or whatever, or, or either that or like, you know, she 
senses danger. Something's about to go down. But she is apparently oblivious to the presence of the kid in the house. Mm -hmm. And she definitely said in a previous episode that she, you know, he was like hearing the sorrow of the entire town of Castle Rock. So the question there is, does that mean that the kid's powers have evolved? Does that mean that he's able to like occlude his presence to her, like he can actually hide out, or, or she is, was it, just, is it sort of like- Henry was just so strong at that point, maybe it just took over. Maybe Henry took over. Yeah, it is strange that Molly doesn't suspect the thing, and she can also tell that Ruth is having a moment here, even though she should have, I would have kept banging on that door the second Ruth said, I, you're, my husband's back, but I'm gonna <laughs> stop him, or any, I, I would have been like, wait, what? <laughs> Think about it for a second, like, uh, actually, yeah, none of that. <laughs> then my my last question is to do with all of the flashbacks that we got, mm -hmm. and whether we'll see any more of this. Is it like is this the time travel episode, or are we going to see more of this process? Now, she could easily stop doing this because she killed Alan. I feel like and put her in that's the, the that's the point to abandon the breadcrumb strategy. Mm -hmm. But I'd be curious to see if it comes back. And one place that we could see it would be with going back to her suicide attempt, which I thought was conspicuously absent from all of the flashbacks that we got in this app in this episode. It's mm -hmm. a very big moment for the character earlier in the season, yeah. and she freaks out because of the dog, and then she throws herself off a bridge, and that that is probably one of the biggest mystery moments in the series so far that wasn't recontextualized or yeah. explained through this episode. And I wonder, are we gonna get that in a, you know, episode eight or nine? I don't know, look at the poster for Castle Rock. I mean, someone standing on a house. Could that have something to do with the reason she jumped off? Or are they just, you know, just making a cool poster? I don't know, we'll see. Ooh, good point. Okay, now for a few comments from you guys. First up, James Knight says, could the kid be the baby that died in childbirth? This would be referring to when Henry told Wendell that their first try at having a kid resulted in the kid not making it. And raising the question, maybe maybe did the kid make it? Uh, I think I've seen this theory f floating around a little bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, it has some weight, right? Also, speaking of that same thing though, what about, you know, Desjardins' kid? that they say died in childbirth with the mom. What if the kid survived and that's what he had in that cellar basement thing, whatever that was, that box. Right, that box. We may have to come back to that box. Mm -hmm. Ryan Shannon wrote, they missed the opportunity for a Christine reference at the junkyard. I was looking everywhere for it, LOL. Uh, I was too. <laughs> I was totally expecting that. There was one moment in there where Alan turns around and he's got a look on his face and I just the thought, gonna, is the car gonna there's be gonna be a Christine reference in this junkyard. I know it. And our last comment comes from somebody on Twitter who wrote, Molly in Castle Rock and Molly, AKA the thing of evil. Coincidence? I think not. It turns out Molly, AKA the thing of evil is his dog. Castle Rock fans have some pretty wild ideas about what's going on in the show, but this Stephen King is definitely a next level fanatic. Okay, that's it for us over here, everybody. This was a great episode. Uh, it's heartbreaking. It's sometimes tough to watch, but oh, it's, it's so good. Um, and we will see you all back here next week for episode eight. And until then, keep it tuned to GameSpot Universe. Bye-bye.